Welcome to the NWATC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to our medical director, uh, Dr. Brian Wood, for the presentation today. Brian? Thanks, Kent. So, going to finish up our two-part series on pneumocystis pneumonia, or PCP. Last week, we talked about some basic biology and risk factors, and today, I'm going to turn to prevention and treatment. So, on the prevention front, and I'm going to talk about uh, starting and stopping prophylaxis and a couple of other considerations. And then I'm going to talk about the recommended agents for treatment and some issues around side effects and treatment failure. And I'll just mention at the end uh, drug resistance, which I think is an interesting issue. So starting with prevention, initiating prophylaxis is key in anyone with advanced immunosuppression. The recommendations from the CDC OI guidelines are to start with anyone who has a CD4 count below 200, that's an A1 recommendation, or oral thrush, that's an A2 recommendation. The other considerations, and we've talked about this on ECHO a couple times, are a patient who doesn't meet those first two qualifications but has a CD4 percentage less than 14, um, that's considered a B2 recommendation and prophylaxis should be considered. And then any other AIDS-defining illness, when someone doesn't meet the other qualifications, it also should be considered. And then, of course, following PCP treatment, and we call that secondary prophylaxis as opposed to the um, other qualifications here, which would be primary prophylaxis. The options for prophylaxis I list here. The preferred is trimethoprim sulfamethoxis sulfamethoxazole, which is Bactrim or Septra in some countries. I'm going to abbreviate that as TMP-SMX for the rest of the talk for the sake of space. The preferred is a double-strength tab daily, although a single-strength tab daily is also <coughs> effective. When, the, when those have been compared in small studies, they've been equivalent. A double-strength tab three times per week is also an alternative. It's probably not quite as effective, but is good and is better tolerated. For those patients, and there are quite a few who don't tolerate Bactrim, Dapsone is another option. It's important to remember to check a G6PD level and make sure the G6PD level is normal. Otherwise, there's a higher risk of hemolytic anemia. The usual dose of Dapsone is 100 milligrams daily, though it can also be used at 50 milligrams BID. Atovaquone or Mepron is another alternative for those patients who don't tolerate Bactrim or Dapsone, and uh, those patients do exist. The biggest limiting factor of atovaquone is its cost. I've tried to get it for a couple patients recently without success. It's just very expensive. It's a liquid. For prophylaxis, the recommendation is 1,500 milligrams daily. And then the final option is inhaled or aerosolized pentamidine, which is sometimes the best tolerated but does have a lot of limitations. It's given nebulized every month. It can cause bronchospasm, so giving some albuterol beforehand can help. It doesn't always get to the periphery of the lungs. It doesn't protect against extrapulmonary um, extra pneumocystis. Extrapulmonary pneumocystis is quite rare, but when it does happen, it's often in a patient who's been receiving aerosolized pentamidines prophylaxis. So my general strategy is um, to always try Bactrim first if someone doesn't tolerate it. I often try Dapsone, though um, some patients who have a reaction to Bactrim won't tolerate Dapsone either. If I can get it, uh, um, and I'm referring to cost issues, then I like a Tovaquone next, and if not, inhaled pentamidine monthly. In terms of stopping prophylaxis, this question comes up a lot as well. The CDCOI guidelines recommend waiting until the CD4 count is above 200 for at least three months, and that's likely safest, though there have been a few studies looking at early discontinuation, including this systematic review that was done and published in 2011. Um, I'll show you more data on the specific studies this systematic review looked at, but looked at four studies, all of which included stoppage of pneumocystis prophylaxis with CD4 count below 200 in the setting of a suppressed viral load. And the overall rate of PCP um, in all four of these trials was 0.48 per 100 person years, which is quite low. The systematic review concluded that there was inadequate data for evaluating discontinuation with a CD4 count below 100. And so let's look at that data just a little bit further. These are the four studies. The first, published in 2000 in AIDS, was a study from Madrid, 
It was a retrospective review of only 29 subjects who were all on secondary prophylaxis and stopped with a CD4 count uh, 100 to 200 and a viral load less than 500 copies for at least three months and found a very low rate of PCP. The second, um, this study from 2007 in AIDS from Ottawa was a prospective study but only 19 patients. 18 of those on primary prophylaxis, only one on secondary prophylaxis, but in that small number of patients, none developed PCP um, with early discontinuation. The largest trial, the one I bolded here because I think it's the most impressive, is the COHERE study, which was published in CID in 2010. It was a prospective study um, looking at data from 29 European cities, over 23,000 patients included, only primary prophylaxis, so that this did not include any patients on secondary prophylaxis. But in those persons who stopped PCP prophylaxis with CD4 count 100 to 200 and a viral load less than 400 copies, none developed PCP. This trial did also include a subset who stopped with CD4 count below 100, and there was a higher rate. Um, but this was the only trial of, of these that included <coughs> patients who stopped with a CD4 count below 100, and that's why the systematic review concluded that there just wasn't enough data. And then this last trial was a retrospective um, study from Thailand that looked at 215 patients. It was a mix of primary and secondary prophylaxis and also found a very low and acceptable rate. So the conclusion from this is that if you have to stop early because of side effects or intolerance or other issues, it's probably safe, especially if the C4 count is between 100 and 200 and the viral load is undetectable. We don't really have enough data to be confident with C4 count less than 100. Personally, I'm more comfortable stopping early if it's primary prophylaxis, less comfortable if it's secondary prophylaxis because they've already had an episode of PCP and I just think there's less data. Overall, I try to get to a CD4 count above 200 for at least three months, but if there's a reason to stop early, sometimes we do. I think the other interesting question in regards to prevention is how we can prevent exposure. Pneumocystis is a ubiquitous organism. It's very difficult to prevent exposure, but the question that comes up is should infected hospitalized patients with PCP be isolated. I thought this was an interesting study in France. Both of these studies, number one and number two, were done by the same group, published by the same group. This first study was done at several centers in Switzerland and in one city in France. And the number, excuse me, the percent with a dihydroteroate synthetase mutation, which basically implicates exposure to sulfa, the number the percent with that mutation who had never been exposed to sulfa drugs was almost 30% in the centers in Lyon, France versus 3% in Switzerland. So what this is implying is that these patients contracted the infection from someone else who had been exposed to sulfa. And the difference here is that in Lyon, France, they did not have a policy of isolating patients with PCP. Patients with PCP could be in the same room as others who were immunocompromised. So the implication of that is that yes, we probably should at least separate our patients with PCP from others who are immunosuppressed. This same group also published uh, an outbreak of about 30 cases among renal transplant recipients, all of which had, um, uh, were the same strain by genotyping, also implicating human-to-human -human transmission and uh, implying that we should at least be separating our patients who have PCP from uh, others who have suppressed immune system. So I, I think that's in, just an interesting topic for discussion. I'm going to switch now to treatment issues. And here is just a list of the primary treatment options. And I've separated these into mild disease and severe disease and listed some factors that I think should come into play in deciding um, the appropriate treatment. So under mild disease, I'm considering this to be in general, patients who can be treated as an outpatient who don't have significant hypoxia are able to take oral meds and you're confident they're going to be able to adhere the meds. Severe disease, I, I really include most patients who need to be treated in the hospital, anyone with significant hypoxia. In general, anyone who meets qualifications for corticosteroids, I would include under that and I'll talk about steroids a little bit more. Anyone who's unable to take oral meds, of course, um, someone who has a lot of comorbidities that you're worried about, or a need for intravenous pentamidine. The, 
I'll talk more about side effects pentamidine, but due to the um, number of side effects that can happen and the close monitoring that is needed, anyone who needs pentamidine should likely also be hospitalized. So for mild disease, the primary um, treatment is oral, Bactrim. Alternatives for those patients who really cannot tolerate oral Bactrim include clindamycin with primaquin, trimethoprim and dapsone, or atobiquone. I think if somebody has a mild reaction to Bactrim or a non-life-threatening reaction to Bactrim, the other consideration would be desensitization because Bactrim really is the best <coughs> drug here. For severe disease, the recommendation is IV Bactrim for those patients who can't tolerate it. IV pentamidine is another option, and when those two drugs have been looked at head-to-head -head in trials, they've been equivalent. Um, and then <coughs> another option for severe disease would be clindamycin and primaquin, because the clindamycin part can be given intravenously, though the primaquin cannot, so it must be taken oral. So I think of that more as a third line for severe disease. Other key treatment considerations, some questions that often get asked, is it okay to treat somebody empirically if they come in and you have a high suspicion for pneumocystis? The answer is yes, as long as you continue to work them up and confirm the diagnosis. The studies that have shown worse outcomes with empiric treatment for PCP were in settings in which they did not pursue the diagnosis further and they did not confirm the diagnosis. The key point there being our patients uh, with advanced HIV can have multiple different processes at the same time, and you really need to confirm the diagnosis. But you can start treatment, and it will not affect your diagnostic workup. The standard course of treatment is 21 days. Important to remember that corticosteroids should be used if there's significant hypoxia, and generally the guidelines are if the PaO2 is less than 70 or the AA gradient is greater than 35. The standard course would be something like prednisone, 40 milligrams twice daily for five days, and then uh, once daily for five days, and then uh, uh, lowering the dose to 20 for 11 days, or something along those lines is generally standard, especially for um, uh, oral therapy. It can be converted to IV if needed. The recommendation for pregnancy is Bactrim, trimethoprim, Dapsone is an alternative. And the other question that I think comes up that's interesting is should treatment be based on prophylaxis? For example, if a person develops pneumocystis while on prophylactic Bactrim, should they get an alternate agent for treatment? And the answer is no, and I'll talk about resistance more in a second, but really the answer to that is that resistance to Bactrim and the other drugs is quite rare, and most people who fail prophylaxis do so either because of imperfect adherence, very advanced immunosuppression, um, or other factors. So no matter what prophylaxis they're on, Bactrim is the recommended treatment agent. This is um, just a table of possible side effects from some of these agents. Uh, the most impressive thing, I think, is just uh, how many side effects can happen, the number of these that can cause rash, the number of these that can cause bone marrow suppression. Um, a lot of patients cannot tolerate Bactrim either because of rash, renal or hepatic dysfunction, um, remember, trimethoprim can act as a potassium-sparing diuretic, can cause hyperkalemia, and there also, of course, can be bone marrow suppression. The star here next to Dapsone and Primaquin is a, a reminder to check a G6PD level um, before uh, using either of those drugs. The recommendation is that you can start the drug and check the G6P, G6PD level at the same time. You just need to remember to do it um, and consider other agents if the G6PD level is not normal. Um, and Pentamidine, I just wanted to make a note. Pentamidine can be very effective for pneumocystis, but has a lot of possible toxicity. It's a hard drug to use. It can cause electrolyte changes, which can lead to arrhythmias. It can cause renal or hepatic dysfunction, hypotension, hypoglycemia often early on, pancreatitis, which tends to track along the same um, lines as the nephrotoxicity and get worse as the nephrotoxicity. Uh, increases, and then whereas patients can initially be hypoglycemic as the pancreas burns out, they can actually become hyperglycemic and develop insulin-dependent diabetes, and then it can also cause bone marrow suppression. So for anyone needing IV pentamidine, best to have them in-house and to be monitoring um, electrolytes, blood sugar, blood pressure very closely. In terms of treatment failure, I think this is a really big question in treating PCP and a question for which we don't have a lot of answers. PCP can worsen in the first couple of days in which you start treatment, and that's one thing that the corticosteroids help with. It should, in general, improve um, by 
a week or so. But if not, I think we just don't really know what the best strategy is, and there's lots of different things that are tried. I think the for sure thing is concomitant other infections need to be ruled out. Otherwise, all of these strategies I think I've seen at some point um, or employed at some point. So switching oral meds to IV can help. Switching an IV med to an alternate agent can help, but whether it's better to switch to an alternate agent or add an additional agent, I think we really don't know. That's never really been studied. Um, I'd be interested to hear other people's strategies. I tend to switch before adding, but um, I really think it's debatable. Sometimes uh, if patients get worse as you taper their store steroids, putting the steroid dose back up can help. I've done that before. Sometimes extending the duration. Sometimes people have really severe, really refractory disease. 21 days just isn't enough. I've done that before. And then I, adding in a kinocandin has been done. There's lots of case reports uh, for adding in a kinocandin. In theory, a kinocandin should work for pneumocystis because they inhibit 1,3-beta-D-glucan. Um, uh, synthesis, um, and we know there's one 3 beta d glucan in the walls of pneumocystis, but in general, kind of cannabis just aren't effective alone for treatment, and we really just don't have good data for when they should be added. But there are case reports listing um, effectiveness of, of that strategy. Overall, factors associated with poor prognosis in PCP, the biggest are severe disease or very advanced immunosuppression. Studies have shown that it, um, significant hypoxia needing ICU admission or mechanical ventilation um, is associated with poor outcomes, as is older age, higher LDH in some studies, prior episodes of PCP, or low albumin. And then just to finish up, a note on drug resistance. So like we talked about last week, pneumocystis can't be cultured. So our, some of our traditional methods for testing drug sensitivities just don't work. So the studies that look at drug resistance look for these mutations that are known to be associated with trimethoprim or sulfamethoxol or dapsone use. So the dihydrofolate reductase mutation is associated with trimethoprim use. The dihydroteroate synthase mutation is associated with um, sulfamethoxol or dapsone use. And that's the mutation that's more common and more commonly looked at in studies. The thing is that even finding these mutations is not always associated with treatment failure. There are studies that um, have found an association, lots of other studies that have not. So really, I think we do not know how important these mutations are, when they are important, when they are not. And the bottom line is that Bactrim is always first line for treatment if a patient can tolerate it. I'll just summarize, and then we'll have a minute for questions and discussion. So um, prophylaxis is indicated for a CD4 count below 200, thrush, prior episodes of PCP. We talked about rules for stopping. The guidelines are CD4 count above 200 for at least three months, um, though we talked about the data uh, for stopping early in cases in which it likely might be safe if you need to stop. Should likely separate patients with PCP from other immunosuppressed patients. We talked about some of the data for human-to-human -human transmission. And again, the first line for prophylaxis and treatment is Bactrim, and we talked about some of the drug side effects. There's really no clear guidelines for managing treatment failure. Um, do not think drug resistance is the primary factor associated with treatment failure, more likely severe disease or severe immunosuppression. So why don't we stop there and have a minute for questions and comments from the group.